Hello everybody, my name is Jack Pittman, and I'm here to teach you how to use Bartel Media's Macro Recorder. This tool will enable you to make computer macros for your work or video gaming leisure. And by the end of this course, I'm going to teach you the strategies you can use to effectively make macros quickly. It's going to take some practice, but by learning absolutely every single feature available in Macro Recorder through this course, you're going to be able to rise ahead. You'll need to use this chapter screen in order to navigate this course, as it's almost an hour and a half video. You can see all of the timestamps here. Pause the video and go to the exact spot that you want to learn. To begin, use the link below this video to get the free demo version of Macro Recorder. This will allow you to test and learn all of the features, including the paid features that I use in the video. And if you choose to purchase this, please use my link in the description because I'll get a percentage of that payment that you make. Thank you for your support, and I hope that you enjoy my course. Now, I'm hoping you'll prefer to use my video to learn about Macro Recorder, but let's say I forget something, don't include something, or some new feature gets added, and you want to learn from the text files themselves, then you can go to macrorecorder.com slash doc. This is going to give you a table of contents that includes list text instructions of every single feature and how to use it. This is quite useful. Although almost everything here is included in my video, uh, I tried to make it more relatable and easier to use because I understand that these things can be quite confusing. That being said, you should still know where this is. Let's start with a very simple macro. You'll learn about recording and playing a macro, which is how you build them. Macros are usually recorded by doing some tasks with the program running, and after that, you edit the macro, which is the part that's a bit more like coding, all right? We'll use Google Chrome, and we'll make a very simple macro where you open 10 new tabs in Google Chrome, all right? We're going to click on Record with Macro Recorder up, and now I'm going to go control T, 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 and then escape. You can see that this recorded exactly what I was doing. It recorded me pressing T with the control key down multiple times. What we're going to do is change this playback speed and make it 10 times faster. We're going to set it to 1,000 and then set the repetitions to one to make sure it doesn't loop. All right, now what we're gonna do is go into Google Chrome and I'll enter the hotkey to start the macro and boom, look at that, 10 new tabs, easy peasy. I didn't have to waste my effort pressing that button anymore. Now, if you wanted to do it again, look, just boop, one more time. Now, this is very simple, but you can see how once you get used to using macros, you can really, really cut down on the amount of mental effort it takes and the amount of time it takes to accomplish basic and simple tasks. One thing you'll need to understand well is the active window. The active window is where your mouse is last clicked basically. For example, this macro will only open new tabs if Google Chrome is active. If I minimize everything and I go to my desktop and I start the macro, it's running right now, but what, my computer doesn't care that I'm clicking Control T. I'm not in an active window that does anything about that. So, when you're making macros, you need to be really aware of where you last clicked and what window is active, especially if you're using keyboard keys like we're using in this simple Google Chrome macro.
Most of the time, games and other windows that are full screen won't properly recognize the macro recorder's actions unless that game is the active window and also you're recording the mouse movement's full path. So in order to do that, go to File and then Settings and click on Recording. From here, make sure that Record Mouse Paths is enabled. Once you have this set up, then your mouse path will be recorded by the macro. Let's show you this to illustrate it. We're going to record a new macro. And in this macro, we're just going to move from one spot to another, move from one spot to another, move from one spot to another. And now we'll click Escape. If we play the macro, you can see my hands are up and the mouse is moving around. You have multiple options for how Macro Recorder handles mouse movement. Usually, you'll be able to use this linear setting. So if we play the macro with the linear setting on, you can see that the mouse will just move directly from the start point to the end point. Whereas if we use as recorded, then it's going to do something similar to what we did when we recorded it. Okay? This is the same area where you would change the amount of repetitions. Something important to know. If you're having problems with your macro running, maybe in a game or in a specific program, the, the window change is going to be useful in that situation. Earlier you saw me delete the window changes, and that's just because it's easier to make the macro more reliable that way when you're just using it and remaking the macro every time you use it. Let's make a window change happen so you know what I'm talking about. Record a new macro and then Alt-Tab. Now look, it's Wondershare from Mora. Ah, confusing. Click Escape. This ends the macro. You can see our alt tabs were recorded, and then there is a window change event here. So what's interesting about this macro is that if you take these alt tabs and you get rid of them, and then we play the macro, see how it changed to the correct window? This effectively forces the macro to run in the specific window. Now, the reason I delete this is because this is really, really specific. When you relaunch that program again, and it's a different instance of the program running, it may or may not consider it the same thing. And that can make things kind of buggy sometimes. So I usually avoid them unless I really know they're right. If if you're encountering the problem where your macro isn't working, the hotkey is not getting recognized, it's not playing when you're in the game, uh, usually that has something to do with this, or your mouse path, or it could be that the game isn't kind of letting the computer see the hotkey because the game does something with that button. So the macro isn't even able to run. If you want to test, to make sure it really is working, then what you need to do is use clicks to start the macro and then change to the correct window. And then if the macro doesn't work in your game with it already running, uh, then you know that it's, it's another problem. But probably it's gonna work at that point because what's happening is that in the game, um, Macro Recorder just isn't able to see that you're pressing the start button, basically. And as you, as you noticed when I recorded this, having the window change event there means that you don't have to have the Alt-Tab commands there. So you're often going to Alt-Tab and then delete those Alt-Tabs when you actually edit your macro. Now, if you noticed earlier, I was able to just play the macro with a press of a button. That's because I set up a playback hotkey. 
This is useful because it means you don't have to come into Macro Recorder and click play here. You can just be in the tool or game or whatever you're using and press the play macro hotkey. Let's set up the hotkey. You can go to file and then from here, click on settings. From there, click on hotkeys and you can see the hotkeys that are available. All you really care about right now is this playback hotkey. I personally use page down, but if you use page down a lot in your work for whatever reason, then you'll want to pick a different button because this is going to be a button you use a lot to play whatever macro it is that you have made. As you noticed, most macros are made by recording the macro and then editing the recording that you just made. You'll be able to set up some hotkeys so that you can start your macro whenever you want, and you can also set up a hotkey to record the macro so that you don't have to go into the program to press start recording. You've also learned how mouse paths work and the difference between linear mouse paths, which kind of average out the distance between two points, and the actual recorded mouse path, which is where the program does the same thing, or something very similar, to what you did with the mouse. Now, these may seem simple, but by building upon these basic concepts and introducing some more to you that are much more fun, you're going to be able to make some very sophisticated macros in no time. Welcome to Old School RuneScape. I'm gonna use this game against Terms of Service to illustrate the next couple macro concepts to you. And the reason I'm gonna do this is because showing it in this game is going to make it much easier for you to understand. That being said, this is against the game's terms of use. Using macros in many video games does get you banned. If you want We're going to make a basic click macro. And from there, we're going to replace those clicks with some image recognition so you guys can get a taste of that. And after that, we're gonna add in something called pixel weights. And a pixel weight is incredibly useful. A pixel weight looks at one specific pixel on the screen and waits for it to be a certain color. And this is so powerful. I know that sounds simple, but it allows you to make sure that before you perform an action, the thing is in the right place. And this allows you to make much more robust, reliable macros that you can trust will repeat. And if they fail, they're not gonna screw anything up. If you've never played RuneScape before, all you need to know for the purposes of this tutorial is that we're mining these rocks, see? They're brown. Once we mine them once, we get a piece of ore and the rock turns gray. When the rock is gray, we cannot click it because nothing will happen. See, it turned gray and now if I click it, see my character doesn't do anything because there's nothing to mine there. Once it turns brown, you can click again. And notice my inventory is filling up with this iron ore. So what we want is to make a macro that clicks on these when they're brown and then continues until the inventory is full and then drops the whole inventory. And we want that macro to repeat on the loop. And the reason I'm showing you this is because I'll get a chance to show you basically every feature of Macro Recorder this way. Let's make the first part of the macro. Bring up Macro Recorder, start recording, and just click on the first node wait a little bit, go to the next one. Notice how slow I'm being. When you make macros, you really wanna be slow when you do your first recording. Don't rush. Okay, so that's it. This macro is really basic. 
we're going to get rid of all of these window changes as usual. And now we have our macro. Now if we click pl our playback hotkey, you can see that the macro is gonna do exactly what we just did. Now this is a very, very basic macro. Next, we'll add some more features to this macro. Because that's Now I'm gonna interrupt us here just for a moment to really emphasize how important it is to re-record your macros, especially when you're learning. Your macros will mess up. And if you keep trying to use the same one that you have saved and you are too attached to it, you are not going to learn. You will become a much more effective macro creator if you remake the macro each time you need it and just keep doing that over and over and over and over again. This is going to have a profound impact on your ability to create macros that actually work. Because if you're not careful, and if you don't practice, and you don't study, then you're going to spend so much time messing your macros up that you w would have been better off just doing the work normally, okay? It's really easy to mess things up. So I encourage you to get in the habit of making the macro you need and using it. And then when you need it next time, make a new one and use it, okay? That is going to really help you. Don't get too attached to a macro that you have saved, all right? Now that we've got our really basic click macro, show you the repetition section. Let's increase the playback speed a little bit. Let's say we double it, and we're gonna set the mouth paths to linear, and repetitions we're gonna set to three, okay? Now, let's run our macro again. Just in time. So you can see if you run too, if you run the macro too fast, you're gonna click on ore before you mine the ore, like what just happened, right? And it repeated once, so now it's going to the next one. And now it's doing the third repetition. So you can see how looping the macro is great. We can change this setting here to repeat the macro as many times as we want to. However, we're gonna have some problems that, so to speak, accumulate as we loop through our macro. As you can see now, if I click to mine anything, there's no room in my inventory. So I need to make another part of this macro that watches my inventory, and when it's full, gets rid of everything. Let's look at our macro itself before we add the logic to get rid of our inventory. You can see that our macro is basically three parts. There's clicking the first node, clicking the second node, and clicking the third node. We also have these manual wait times. These are always a liability. You never really want to use a manual wait time because chances are at some point you're gonna get it wrong, the computer's gonna lag, something's gonna happen, and this is gonna cause your macro to break. As you saw in our RuneScape example, sometimes the iron wasn't mined yet, but we didn't care and we just clicked on the next one before we got that iron, right? Those kind of issues are going to scale up as you use the macro more. So for this reason, we need to use pixel weights. I'll start by showing you how to use image recognition but then we'll move into pixel weights. As you can see right now, we just kind of click 
randomly, right? We, we just click on a specific spot on the screen. And that's going to happen regardless of where the camera is looking, which can make weird things happen. In a video game, your character can go run off somewhere else. Or in a work setting, you can start clicking on stuff and deleting things and making more of a problem than the work you're trying to solve. So using image recognition is really useful for this. To use image recognition, we're actually just going to edit the existing macro. And this is a common trend. You often record a basic framework. And once you have that basic framework and the timing set up, then you're going to add and replace the basic framework with more complexity and grow it and test it and grow it and test it. Don't try and make a really complicated macro just from the beginning. Make it as simple as possible and then make it more complex by adding a feature at a time, right? We want to replace this click with image recognition. So to do that, we're going to be near the click, under the click, and then click on this detect image here. And now we're going to go to capture bitmap. All right. We press this and we're going to look at the tips of these rocks. So we're going to go for that one right there. And then if the image has been found, then put the mouse position to the center of the image. And then go to next. That's fine. Now I can copy this and I can paste it underneath each of our clicks. Instead of making a new one, all I need to do is double click on the one I just pasted and click this button so that I can find and replace it with a new image. Now we're going to replace the third image. which is going to be this one right here. So we've added these three images, but this click is still just happening wherever it wants to. So we're going to change that. This image finder, what it's going to do is look for this here and put the mouse cursor in the center of the screen, but it's not going to click anything. So afterwards, we need to make a click that is relative to the current mouse position. This means that wherever the mouse happens to be, the program's just going to click there. And that is what you actually want. We're going to put that setting under each of the images that we found. Okay. So now, let's see if our macro works. We're going to hold shift and just kind of get rid of some of this iron in our inventory. And now let's play our macro. It found the first image, clicked on it, found the second image, clicked on it, found the third and clicked on it. And it's going to repeat this for the number of times we told it to loop. Now, one more note on image recognition. This feature looks at the current frame. What this means is if you're looking at a complex scene, like a 3D environment in a video game or a rendering in a video, it's very likely the program is going to miss the frame you want. Macro Recorder doesn't look at every single frame that your computer makes. It's only able to look at, you can imagine, a frame every second or two, right? It's faster than that, but that's how you should imagine it. What this means is you can miss stuff. So these image recognition macros are really only going to work on simple 2D graphics. Usually you want to stick to things inside menus and stay away from using image recognition, say, on a video. It's really unlikely that your image recognition will work on a video because the amount of time that the image exists as is, is so small. Aside from that, there's a few settings that you should be aware of now that you understand how to use these image recognitions. First, the search area. You want to set it to focused window unless you have a reason not to. 
There's also this restrict search area here. And this allows you to define a specific area of the screen to look for this image. And this will help make the macro faster. And it'll also allow you to kind of prevent some false positives that may be happening from the same kind of image showing up in other parts of the screen that you don't really want the program to look for. Aside from that, the next really useful feature is what to do if the image is not found versus found. You'll, you can play around with these logics here, and we're going to do that later, because this can basically make it so if your macro doesn't find exactly what you want, you wait for so long that the macro just ends, your computer turns off, whatever. It, it just pauses. Now we're going to add a pixel weight. See how the inventory is basically full, except for the very bottom here? We're going to watch this spot, and then once it gets full, we're going to empty our whole inventory. So here's our macro. We're going to scroll all the way down to the bottom, and then we're going to go up here into the record and edit section, under the weight, click this arrow, and then do a weight for pixel color. From here, go into the spot, click space, and now Macro Recorder will watch this exact pixel for this color. And when the color shows up, also known as when the inventory space is empty, then the macro is just going to end because you want to keep mining, and the mining is in the beginning of the macro. But if the color doesn't show up after, let's say, one second of waiting, then instead of ending, the macro's going to go to the next option here. Now that we've added this pixel weight, it's going to activate when this last inventory slot gets full. But what do we want it to do? Well, we want it to drop our whole inventory. So in order to do that, we need to add a new recording to our existing recording. So click on the little arrow underneath the record button to get to append recording. Now this is adding commands to the bottom of our macro. We're going to hold down shift and then click on every single spot here. This is going to drop our entire inventory. OK, now I clicked Escape. But remember, we just added all that, but there's Alt tabs and there's always confusing stuff. You want to get rid of the Alt tabs every time you add anything. OK, so we're going to get rid of all these, delete them. And now we have our pixel weight, which checks for the color right there. As you can see, it's showing up on the screen, the little red circle. And then it'll deposit our whole inventory on the floor. Now, you can see that we have a full inventory. When the macro completes its first loop, it's going to notice that our inventory is full. And what's it going to do? Let's see. Here's the rock that will fill the inventory. Now the inventory is full. And so it noticed. And it's getting rid of all of the iron. And now that last spot is empty, so it'll just keep going forward. And this is exactly why pixel weights are awesome. Now that we've covered image recognition and pixel weights, I'm going to tell you about one of the expensive paid features. Most of you don't need this. I personally don't even pay for this version of the tool because it's not necessary. But for some of the more advanced users watching this video, you should know how this works and what it's for. Now, this is called increment parameters, OK? And what you do, basically, is you, you, it's, you use it when you want to change where you're clicking. Because if you notice in the macros I've made so far, 
Every time you run the macro, you're going to click in the exact same place over and over and over and over and over and over again. And some programs will sort of ban you because they know you're a robot, so a human never does that. And the same thing can happen in games. So there's a way to work around this, and that's using increment parameters. What you would do is you would use this set parameters from list feature here under miscellaneous. And imagine that you have four kind of clicks in your macro, and you want to change them. So we're going to add some values here, 1, 5, 2, and 7. And we're going to make it so it looks at the x here. So this means that every time the macro repeats, it's going to sort of replace the value of the variable, such as the x click coordinate, the y click coordinate, the timeout, the weights, the target window, all of this stuff can change. So you basically make a text file that the macro looks at to determine what variable it's going to use for that loop. So you can imagine that you could have a text file that sort of has some random numbers, let's say, like this. And my macro will click in the same place, but the first time it clicks, it'll increment the coordinate by one pixel. The next, it'll be five. The next, it'll be two. And the next, it'll be seven. So in effect, this means that your macro won't click in the same place. You could totally randomize it if you wanted to by using this randomize parameters thing. And you can put a range, so it'll put a random x-coordinate from 0 to, let's say, 15. And that will give enough variety that you're never actually clicking in the same place. You're just clicking very close to the same place. All right? Now, using image recognition allows you to take a certain part of the screen and look for it. But remember that this really only works with menus parts of a web page that aren't moving. If you try and capture an image that is only on the screen for a second or a couple frames, it's not going to work. Image capture in this way really only works for menus and two-dimensional objects, okay? You're going to struggle if you're trying to use image capturing on moving video. So use something else. And as far as pixel weights go, these are also very powerful. When you start getting in the habit of using pixel weights, then when your maxil, well, then when your macros break, instead of clicking all over the place and doing random stuff, your macro is just going to do nothing and stop. It's so much smoother to use pixel weights in a macro, whether it's for work or for gaming, than it is to just use manual wait times. They are clunky and it's very easy for something to go wrong because... Next, we're going to look closer at our mining macro to learn about the label feature. As you guys saw, this macro just mines three nodes on a loop and then it looks at a pixel to make sure that the inventory isn't full, and then when the inventory is full, it runs this part and drops the inventory, okay? So the way that the program works, if it's running, it goes, it's running, it goes to here, and then it goes back to the beginning. It goes, it's running, it goes to here, goes back to the beginning. Goes, it's running, gets to here, goes back to the beginning. Until the inventory is full, at which point it will go from here and all the way down and triggered dropping the inventory. And what I want to teach you about next is labels, because labels are really, really useful for navigating your macro. A label allows your macro to start from within itself instead of from the very beginning. For example, let's say that we get to this pixel weight here. And we have said that when the color shows up, you go to start. And when the color doesn't show up, you go to the label drop. 
which just happens to be the next command. But if you wanted to, this could actually be part of a really long macro, and every single component in the macro has a label. And instead of actually running from top to bottom, the macro runs to each label. So by adding labels, you allow a huge complexity in your macro because the label can be put in any command. For example, let's say I wanted to call this weight here the waiting label. Boom. Now I have a specific marker in my macro that I can run commands related to. Using labels is really, really important. And it's going to be something that enables you to make much more developed macros. Now that we're very clear on what labels are, we're going to learn about repetitions, go to, and loops. As any of you programmers know, a lot of programming is figuring out how to make a program with as little code as possible that runs on a loop repeating itself over and over again. These kinds of programs make sometimes the most durable solutions. Whereas if you have a program that is thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of code, it may be very powerful today, but in three weeks, it may do absolutely nothing, and you may need to spend an hour or two fixing it. You generally want things to be simple and repeating, not long and one time. If you really take this seriously and focus on making solutions that are small and repetitive, you'll have a much better time programming and making macros than if you're just trying to make one great big grand solution that fixes your problem. Focus on repetitions and loops, okay? And labels are really important for this. Now let's look at some of the miscellaneous commands here. We have repeat and go to. I'm going to start with the go to command because we actually already use a go to command in our mining macro. As you can see, this is the weight that is marked as drop. After our pixel weight, if it sees the inventory is full, it goes to the drop label. So this go to command here can be an individual like this. It's an individual command, goes to the drop label, right? And we would actually put it here. But go to's can also exist inside other commands. For example, this pixel detection, right? Configure what to do if the color shows up, go to the start label. Configure what to do if the color doesn't show up, go to the drop label. There are some situations where you would use one of these individual go-to's here, right? But in most cases, you would actually just use the go-to's that are built into other commands. But it's really important to understand what it means. Go to these options. If you only see go to, start, end, and next, you might think that you can only go to the start of the macro, the next command, or the end of the macro. But that's not actually true. You can go to any label that you have placed on any command in the entire macro. All right? And now, in the same way, you can add one of these repetitions. So, repetitions perform the actions in between one label for a certain amount of time or a certain amount of repetitions. So there's actually two ways to get Macro Recorder to repeat actions. You can go into the top in the playback settings here, where the playback speed is, and set the repetitions to 27, 
for example, or you can actually add the individual miscellaneous command repeat and pick the specific label that you want repeated. So instead of going through the file logically from top to bottom, it's going to get to that label and then repeat that command as many times as you want. And then after it finishes, it'll use another go to normally to go to the end of the macro. But you could just make it go to the beginning of the macro, in which case the macro would never actually end. And I want you guys to understand that because there's a lot of flexibility you have here. You can make a macro that has this repetition thing here set to one and have it never end and always be running. If you use go to's, labels, and repetitions, okay? Saving and loading your macro is very easy. All you have to do is go to File, Save As, and then to load the macro, go to File, Open, and then pick whichever one you want. It works the same as saving or loading a Word doc or any other computer program. Keep in mind, however, that with macros, you shouldn't rely on saving and loading a macro especially if you're learning. You should remake your macro every time you need it. You are going to learn much, much more by remaking macros so many times that you can remake the macro in one or two minutes before doing the task. Do not rely on saving and loading your macros. That being said, you should know how to just in case. Now that we've played our games for the day, we're going to get serious and you're going to learn about web automation. There's tons you can use macros to do, and if you've ever had a job where you need to move thousands of things from one place to another, or you need to edit the meta for hundreds of different objects on your client's website, guess what? This is all stuff that you can make greatly faster with macros. And the next section is all about web automation and the things that you can do. One of the main features we're going to be using is something called smart record and smart clicks. These are features of macro recorder that basically use the image recognition we used earlier in our RuneScape macro and they combine it with a click. So when you're using Smart Record, you record, and every time you click somewhere, the program is going to, before it clicks, it's gonna take an image, take a little, uh, little photo of the area you clicked in, and then it's gonna click. So when you run the macro, it will only perform that click if it finds the image. And you may ask, isn't that the same as image recognition? And it is. But with image recognition, you have to add it in after you record the macro. Whereas when you're doing things like simple web tasks, you can use smart recording and just click and the image recognition gets built in automatically. It's a very useful tool. I will give a bit of a disclaimer here that smart record is a paid feature. So you can try it out on the free trial, but you do need to get the pro version of the tool, which is around $150 in order to use this feature. It's a one-time payment. It's very much worth it if you're using these things on a regular basis. If you're not really sure and you're just trying to learn, don't buy anything, okay? Just learn and use the free trial, try the things out, work around the fact that you can't use the full version of the tool and you'll get to a point where you either know it's worth it or it's not. I just want to make sure that you understand what is available and how to purchase it. You don't need to purchase it, that's okay. I just want to make these things clear for you, okay? Next, you're gonna learn about semi-automatic macros and smart record and smart clicks. 
But before I get to that, I want to make sure that you understand the general workflow that will apply to every single macro that you make. This is called record, edit, test. All right. Every time you start the macro, it's going to be like this. You record, you alt tab to some other random window. Here's the video I'm editing that you're watching right now. Trippy, right? And then you exit by clicking escape and that ends the macro. After you've done that, you're going to get rid of all the alt tabs and window changes and crap in the beginning. And then you're probably going to look for some of the wait times and you're going to edit the wait times, make them shorter, or you're going to add a pixel wait instead of a regular wait time. You're going to do this kind of stuff. And then you play the macro and test it. You will do that for every single macro you make, no matter what it is, whether it's in a game, whether it's for work, whether it's you learning and practicing. Record the macro, edit the commands, test it. That is the workflow that you will use, okay? And now that you understand that, I'll show you how to apply that wor workflow to make a semi-automatic macro that makes you have to click once instead of multiple times, okay? Now we're going to learn about something I call semi-automatic macros. These are very short macros. They do not fully automate a task, but you can make them quickly and use them straight away and they save you a lot of time. Usually these kind of macros are useful when you're working for someone else and there's something you have to do that you have to do hundreds or thousands of times. As an example situation here, I'm going to use a real life scenario from my work. I work with a company that has a course website. So basically I do video editing and I make courses out of content other people produce. Okay. So what I often have to do is change the sharing and embed and meta meta settings of these files that are on uh, a hosting service called Vimeo. You don't really need to understand any of that. All that you need to understand is see all these tabs. There's like 20 of them here or something. But normally when I do this, it's with like 400 tabs. Okay. It's, it's a lot of stuff that's really repetitive. And what I do is I have to go over here, click this privacy thing, enable downloads, and then go over here and click this advanced cog. And this is going to take the whole page to a different menu. Okay. And I have to do that for every single one of these tabs. So let me just do it again. I'll go to the next tab, click on this, click on that, click on that. Next tab, click on that, click on that, click on that. Next tab, click on that, click on that, click on that. Okay. That's what I have to do. Let's make a macro that does it significantly faster than I'm able to. So I've, I'm reverting everything back to how it was right now. There we go. Now everything is how we started. We're going to open up Macro Recorder and I'm going to make a new macro. We're going to click record. And from here, we're going to click on privacy and then click on allow downloads and then click on the advanced wheel and click escape. Now that we've made that macro once, we'll take all of the window changes and alt tabs and get rid of them as usual. And I'm going to make it significantly faster. So we're going to change the wait times so that they're 250 milliseconds, 150, 150, 150, and 150. And now we're going to go 
to our next page here and click our macro. Oh, and it's doing it slowly. You see that? We don't actually want that. What we're going to do is change the playback speed so that it only repeats once. And the playback speed is around, let's say, 400. OK? Now let's see what happens. We go to our next macro. Start the macro. Does the thing. Next one. Does the thing. OK? This is a semi-automatic macro. As you can see, all it does is just click on things a little bit faster. But I don't know if you noticed, but we actually have a little bit of a problem here. Sometimes it clicks a little bit too fast on that Allow Downloads button. And it actually hasn't come up yet. So now what we're going to do is redo this, except we're going to use the Smart Record feature, which helps prevent this problem from happening. Now, you can see that we have the same task open as before. This time, I'm going to use the Smart Record feature just to show you how useful it is. What Smart Record does is it replaces your regular clicks that we were using in the previous macro with smart clicks, which look for the image that you then click on. And this is very powerful because it means that the macro is going to notice if something's wrong and then just not do anything. And this means that it's not going to mess it up, whereas a click macro has no boundaries. It will click no matter what's happening whether that screws up your work and makes more work for you or does what you want it to do. So let's counter this exact same situation, except make a solution with Smart Record. Go into Macro Recorder, get rid of our macro here, and then we're going to go to this little arrow and click Smart Record. Now we went to our window. We're going to do the same thing. Click on Privacy and then click on Allow Downloads, and then click on this cogwheel. Boom, now we click Escape, and let's look at our macro. So as usual, it starts off with all the crap that we can get rid of, which is all of these uh, window changes and wait events. Let's get rid of all these. And so you can see that the macro starts by looking for this icon to click on, and then it waits. These weights are now basically irrelevant because the macro is not going to click on these until they show up. So we can make them super, super short or just get rid of them almost entirely. We're going to make them really short and set them to 150 milliseconds. 150 milliseconds. And we're going to get rid of this escape command here because that was just ending the macro. And you can see that this smart macro is really small. It's only five lines, and two of them are weights. Let's see how it actually performs in our tool. Now we're going to prepare and start the macro. Boom, boom, boom. What? Did you see how fast that was? Oh, but this time it didn't click here properly. Let's go to the next one. Boom, boom. OK, so it looks like the macro is working, but for some reason it's not finding the last part. If you'll notice, it's not finding this cog. So let's change this. We're going to get rid of it and replace it with another mouse click, or a smart click, by going to the page we want. And this time, we're going to click in the sort of center, OK? Just like that. So it actually got the whole image this time. Now our macro is back to how it was. And let's see how it goes on the next tab. I click 
the macro start hotkey. Boom, boom, boom. Look at that. Now click it again. Done, done. And for some reason, it always fails to click on that cog. And as you've noticed, in this case, well, maybe we should just change this. Instead of a smart click, let's get rid of it. And let's just make it a regular mouse click, since this cog is always in the same position. All right. So there we go. There's our mouse click. OK. So now it's going to use smart record for the first two, right? For this and then this one. And then it's going to use a regular mouse click for the last one. And that's just because we were having some issues finding it reliably. OK. So now let's run our file. Click, 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 click. Now you can really see, once you get the macro working, you see how fast this is? Way, way better than just individually doing everything, right? And all that is, really, is just making five lines in this macro recording tool. And as you can see, you should, or as you saw earlier, you should never expect everything to just work. Always test it before you run it multiple times, especially if you're not going to be monitoring your computer. And you might find that sometimes you need to replace certain problematic areas with manual things, such as this regular mouse click instead of the smart mouse click. Keep in mind that whenever I reuse this macro, the first part of it is going to work almost every time. But then I'll have to change this mouse click here depending on where the window is located. So in practice, after you make macros, you'll find that you load the macro and then just double check some known problematic areas and continue forward as usual. Now we'll learn how to move text. I'm going to teach you about a free to use program called Sublime Text. If you're using it for professional purposes, then you need to purchase it, but any of you can use it for free for educational or personal reasons. Sublime Text is basically a text editor with multiple cursors. This allows you to move and manage large amounts of data. I'm going to illustrate how you can use macros and Sublime Text to consolidate a bunch of information. If you look at the left panel here, we have a uh, Google Chrome tabs. We've got a bunch of different Google Docs. They're all just template files. By using Control Tab, we can navigate through these files. On the right, we have Sublime Text. Now, what we want is to be able to take all of these documents and put them onto the right. And we're going to start recording. From here, I'll Alt Tab to the right windows. And now we will click on the left, control A to select everything, control C to copy, click on the right, control A to select everything, then press end, and then control V to paste, and then you're good, okay? Now we can click on the left and go control W, boom, all right? Click escape to end the macro. Now that we've recorded the macro, let's get rid of these window changes. For these temporary one-off one macros, you don't really need to worry about window changes, although they are much more useful in bigger, more developed macros. We're also going to remove all of these alt tabs from the very beginning. Now I'm also going to find all of the wait times and I'm going to make them significantly shorter because we want this macro to save us time. So even though we recorded it very slowly, we're going to edit all of them and let's make it run at like 250 milliseconds, okay? And now we're gonna set this playback speed to 400. All right, now let's run it once to make sure that everything worked. I'm gonna Alt Tab to the correct tabs here Let's get rid of this text and let's make sure once we click our hotkey to start the macro, it should take the text from the left, put it in the right, and then 
delete this tab because it's finished. Let's see if it works. Copied, pasted, closed. All right, that worked. Now let's see, how many tabs do we have, right? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, four, 25, 28, okay. So I'm gonna go into macro recorder and on the repetitions here, I'm gonna say repeat 27 times, all right? Now let's open everything up and we should have just created the solution to our work scenario. Start the macro, put your hands up, let's see what happens. Okay, it's copied one, it's pasting it into the bottom, it's closing the windows properly. Notice it doesn't include any images or anything because Sublime Text just accepts plain text being pasted into it. And you could actually make this macro faster, but I did it this way just for a proof of concept so that you guys can clearly understand how you could use macros to move text from one place to another place. This is the moment of truth. Did I count properly? Is it gonna end or is it gonna extra click? Let's see. Oh, it ended. Look at that, we did it. All right, that's it for this. See you in the next section. Now we'll learn how to schedule your macros to run at a specific day, time, hour, week, or month. This will only work in Windows because it uses the Windows Task Scheduler to run a macro. It will not work in Mac. You'll need to find another option, although I do believe that the Mac OS has an alternative. To start, you'll need to make your macro file. We're going to go to Macro Recorder. We have a really basic macro here, and we're saving it as Test A. And make sure to save it as a Macro Recorder file. Okay? After that, You'll go to Task Scheduler, all right? If you want to find the Task Scheduler, go to your Start Bar and search for Task, and then Task Scheduler should come up. This is what it'll, it'll look like if you've never ran it before. To start, go to F Action and create a basic task. Now, you can see that on the Macro Doc page, it actually has instructions for this. So we're going to bring the task scheduler off to the side so that you can see the task scheduler and the instructions at the same time. Now we can see we have to make the file, create a task, give the task a name, pick the schedule, then tell it to use macro recorder, and then we add an argument that has the file name that we did. Okay, so we're going to go to action, create basic task, and this is going to be test macro course task. And then for the trigger, just click next. And let's say we want the task to trigger once per day when the computer starts. Click next. It's going to start a program and that program is Macro Recorder. So, you're gonna browse to find your program and then click it. And then once you've selected the Macro Recorder EXE file that launches Macro Recorder itself, you need to add an argument line, all right? And that argument line is the minus symbol, play equals, and then the path of your macro, okay? So the path of our macro is where the macro file is saved, okay? So we would just sa change the name to test A. And then once per day, when we click on, or when our computer starts, it's going to run this macro. And you can use this feature of Windows Task Scheduler 
to run a macro at any time of day in response to a program launching. For example, let's say that you want to make a macro that runs when you launch a certain game or a Word doc then you can do the same exact thing I just showed you. The task scheduler allows you to run macros in response to actions on your computer. And this is very powerful because it enables you to run multiple different kinds of macros. Whereas if you're just using a playback hotkey to play the one macro you have, you can't play a macro that you saved that isn't loaded. But using the task scheduler, you can play a numerous amount of macros without this problem. So the easiest way to work around being only able to play one macro at a time is to use the task scheduler to assign your saved macros. Okay? Wow, you are really blowing through this video here. You're almost at the end of it. At this point, you understand how to save macros, load them. You know about the workflow. We typically record a macro and then edit it, find the wait times, add in pixel weights and image recognition to make it more robust and reliable. And that's about it. You noticed how I'm always getting rid of all those alt tabs and those window changes. And this is pretty much the standard process, okay? As you can see, there's also scheduling that you can do, and you can save and load the macro, but remember, unless it's really a complicated macro, you don't want to be saving it and loading it. You want to be remaking it from scratch every time you need to do the macro, because this is the only way that you can get to a point where you can just make what you need and use it. All right, if you get too attached to making the perfect macro and saving it and loading it, then you're gonna find that things aren't working, things are breaking, and if you're using a game, well, that means you're gonna click in the same exact place every single time, which means you need to pay for that expensive version I told you about to get that parameter change feature, and that really isn't necessary for most people. So again, get better at not needing to save your macro. Trust me, you're going to thank me in the future. Let's discuss the pricing of this tool so that we can be very clear. Because it's a bit confusing, to be honest. Most software companies tend to make it look like all of their expensive tools are worth buying. Uh, personally, you're kind of forced to just buy the professional version. And let me explain sort of why. The standard version is like $40, okay? So you can use it for commercial use, you can use more than 10 repetitions, you can launch programs and use GoTo and repeat. But you can't, can't use any kind of image recognition, pixel weights, or text recognition, or smart recording, or any kind of post playback. And these are all really, really useful features, particularly pixel weight and image recognition. This stuff is very, very useful. And to get these features, you have to pay for the professional version, which is around $150. Use the link in my description if you are going to purchase the tool, because then I'll get some credit. And honestly, it's the only way I'm making money from this tutorial, is for those of you who purchase this tool using my link, I'll get $20 of your purchase, okay? So if you do get the pro version, please use my link. If you don't use my link, then I won't get anything at all, even though I brought you all of this awareness and information about the tool. There is another version called the enterprise version. This version is $250, so it's a full $100 more than the professional version, and all you get is parameter change, which just allows you to influence the exact actions and values from a list that you've made. This is a very niche thing that those of you who need it already know how to make macros. It is not something that people watching tutorials on YouTube about macros really actually need to use. So 
you can get the Enterprise version if you want, but honestly, I don't think it's worth it. All you need to have a really useful tool with image recognition that works is to get the professional version. So I encourage you to buy the pro version. Go to the link in the description of this video. It's a one-time purchase of $150. That being said, I want you guys to understand how the version history works of Macro Recorder. Because it's true that it's a one-time purchase, okay? However, you only get the current version and any version a year after that purchase. So you can use these programs, these versions, for the rest of your life. However, two or three years from now, you will not be eligible to use the latest version of Macro Recorder. So for this reason, it's really important that before the year passes, you archive some backup installation files. Because if you just go to this download section and then the version history, you can't download old versions of the tool. So you have to make sure that you download the file and you save the install file because they don't keep an archive and in the future you won't be eligible for the latest version of Macro Recorder because your year purchase has expired. That being said, this really doesn't matter. Like, I understand that sucks. They're trying to use their monetizing tricks to get you to buy the tool multiple times. But honestly, you don't need to. You can use it outdated. Um, in some situations, you might have a security vulnerability if you're running it all the time. But for most people, you do not need to worry about that. If you are watching this tutorial, just trying to learn about macros and use them and gain some skills, you don't need to worry about that. Okay? But I just wanted to make sure that it's clear for those of you who are interested. And again, please use the link in the description of this video because if you don't use that link to make the purchase then I'm not going to get any credit for your purchase okay and as you've noticed I love this tool it's great but I really don't like all of the tricks that software companies use to try and monetize their tools and trick their users into purchasing the tool multiple times without realizing what they're doing or getting a feature that you don't even need, but you got tricked into thinking it's worth the extra $200 or whatever. And honestly, I get fed up with all that. That being said, it's a really useful tool. I love it. I use it a lot in my work, and it gives me more time to live my life and do what I care about. Okay? That's it for the pricing section. If you have any comments or questions, please comment below and see if anyone else had the same problem. See if you can help any of the other comments, and I will respond as I have time. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next. There are two other programs by Bartel Media Group that allow you to use macros in a more profound way, and I'm going to tell you about them, okay? The first is a tool called ShareMouse which is used to share the mouse between different computers traditionally. However, with Macro Recorder, it'll allow you to run a macro with multiple mice. For example, let's say that you are running 16 different computers all in one, and you want to run the same macro on all of them, then you're going to be able to do that using this integration, okay? Keep in mind, in order to do this, you will have to purchase an additional tool called ShareMouse, which will cost you $100. If you need to have multiple mouse cursors for your macros, you will need to purchase ShareMouse and use that integration. You can find the link to purchase it in the second line of my description. The other tool that allows more solutions for your macro recording is phrase express phrase express is more of a professional emailing tool 
that happens to do something that's useful for macros. Phrase express itself is basically grammarly. You type one or two words, and then it auto-completes the thing that you type the most. It's a way to put in big text with only little commands, and it really only saves you time if you're working for somebody or you have a lot of workers for you that are copying and pasting already. Phrase Express is basically a copy-paste automator that makes it even faster than it already is to copy and paste. Now for macros, what it does is allow you to tie individual macros to individual hotkeys. And this is something that you can't actually do in Macro Recorder alone. If you want to make 10 different macros and assign all 10 of those different macros to 10 different hotkeys on your computer and have them run each different macro when you press that button, you're going to have to use Phrase Express or do some janky stuff in Task Scheduler in Windows. The easier way is to use Phrase Express. Granted, this is another example of when a software company buries a useful feature in some other random thing they do. Phrase Express is not really that related to macros, but for some reason, if you want to have your macros start with a keyboard shortcut and have multiple keyboard shortcuts, then boom, you gotta purchase their other tool, Phrase Express. And I don't like that, but that being said, I'm affiliated, and if you do purchase this tool, I'll get some money from it. Adding this feature is another $100. So if you want like the full suite of macro options, you need to get the pro ver or the enterprise version of Macro Recorder, which costs like $250. Then you need to get the standard or the pro versions of Phrase Express and of ShareMouse. So in total, you're looking at around $400, $450 for a lifetime full suite, okay? That's the price of everything you need, but chances are you only really need the pro version of Macro Recorder, not all this other stuff. That being said, I wanted to include this so you know exactly where to get it. Hello. Congratulations, you've made it to the end. That's some serious dedication. And I'm going to take this time to rant to you about something that's important to me. You may not know this about me, but my long-term, lifelong goal is to create a video game that is a mental health product. And I see all around me how we fail to understand the world around us and our societies, ourselves, and our governments create laws that hurt people. This may seem irrelevant to you, but it's the exact same thing that happens with macros in video games. If you're in the end of this course, you're probably more open-minded, but believe it or not, I lost people watching this video simply by showing a macro in a video game that they like. Because these people perceive people who use, I don't even know, like, it's a, it's a game where you click and your character automatically walks to where you clicked. It's already autonomous. Is it really that bad to use a macro to make an incredibly dull and boring part of a game more interesting? Honestly, from my perspective, no. Because a lot of the people playing RuneScape around the world they're not in a good circumstance. And anything that gets them monetizable skills is very valuable. RuneScape has a large following of people in countries such as Venezuela, and believe it or not, a lot of RuneScape players are actually in prison. They play RuneScape because they're in jail in real life, but they're able to play RuneScape on a phone and it has a profound impact on their life. It increases the quality of their life in jail, okay? And I want to really speak to these judged, normally misrepresented people. And for me, 
using macros in video games, even when you're not supposed to, is so amazing. It is like, don't get me wrong, I get it. It's a risk, you can lose your account, whatever. It's a game. You're supposed to have fun and learn. And what if you having fun and learning ends up teaching you how to make programs? Do you realize how valuable it is to be able to make programs these days? Of all of the professions you know, who makes more money? A plumber, an electrician, or a programmer? This isn't going away either. And I know this may seem irrelevant to you guys, but I put it in the end of this video because I really believe that making macros is a very healthy habit. Even if you're using it to cheat in games, like, okay, I get it. I understand it's unfair. People don't like that. And I, I get it, it sucks. But look at our reality. We're surrounded by games that ban this and ban people and suspend people, and it's still a huge problem. There are more robots playing RuneScape than there are people playing RuneScape on a good day. On a bad day, it's more people playing RuneScape with botted and macroing and cheating accounts than actual players. And there are so many people doing this that Jagex cannot even ban all of them because they lose too much of their income. So they have to play this kind of cat and mouse game where they're making it seem like they're doing everything they can to get rid of all of them once and for all. But it's impossible. You're never gonna do that. And I can assure you watching this, when I make games, you won't have to deal with any of this bullshit. The games that I make will impact your life, and whether you realize it or not, playing them will make you better at being who you are, a better parent, and better to yourself. I will trick you into treating your life the way you should treat it, with respect and care. I have love for these people, and I can see how we judge and hate and destroy each other. And I will make products that show us, show our children, a better way to live. A more kind and inclusive way. Because at the end of the day, we are all suffering from loneliness. Despite the fact that there is over 8 billion people on this planet, most of us are walking around thinking we feel things that other people do not. As if all of the suffering I feel has nothing to do with what suffering others feel. We make ourselves lonely, we're judged, and we judge others. And this reflects in our video games. <laughs> Just some food for thought. Now you get a little sample of the kind of things I'm into. Thanks for watching though. I mean, really, if you're in this far into it, you're really dedicated. Congratulations, all right? Bye.